when I was teaching in France. I noticed a theme that sort of developed on its own. It wasn't planned. But the theme of the Committee of the Mind. turned into the topic of the retreat and a lot of the instructions outside of the retreat. And toward the end of the stay, there was one woman who was commenting on how her committee seemed to have three types of members. There was the committee member that was creating a situation, another committee member that was actually playing a role within the situation, and then there was a third that was a critic commenting on the other two. I thought it was a pretty good analysis, because our members tend to fall into these three roles. And it's the fact that we have so many different committee members that allows that third role to, to take place. In other words, your committee members are each based around a desire, and they've gained a seat at the table because at some point in the past they were actually able to deliver on a desire. Whether they delivered well or not, that's another issue. But they delivered to some extent. So they become part of the committee. Then one desire will comment on another desire. That's where the critic comes in as they try to jostle among themselves for who's going to get attention, who's going to dominate the discussion. And a lot of the training in the meditation is training the, the critic, the one that looks at your actions and passes judgment on them. Because the critic has a large role to do with conceit, which can either be totally debilitating in the practice or can actually be useful, depending on the kind of conceit you develop. After all, conceit is one of the fetters that keeps tying us to suffering, but it's one of the last ones to be cut. And the canon actually holds a role for it. It's interesting that the suttas that talk about conceit as having a role and desire and craving is having a role in the practice. They're all said by Ananda. In the case of desire, it's the question of can you work for the end of desire and use desire as part of the path? And the example he gives is of walking to a, to a park. You have to have the desire to walk there in order to get there. Once you've gotten there, then the desire is gone. And it's pretty much the same role with conceit. You have to learn how to use conceit skillfully as part of the path, focus you on getting to the, the goal. Once you've gotten to the goal, then you abandon it. And here the conceit is, other people can do this, why can't I? An important part of healthy conceit is recognizing it's not the case that you're already good. If you want to have some pride in the path, it should be pride in the, your willingness to learn, knowing that you will make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, and if there's a critic in your mind that denies the fact that you could ever make a mistake, you've got to stifle that critic, kick it out, because it's not useful at all. Because if your pride is based on the fact that you're already good, it's constantly ready for a fall. In the forest tradition, there's no room for people who are already good. There's a phrase they have of, you know about things before they happen, and you're already masterful before you've even tried something. In other words, you've read all about things, you've heard all about things, and you know this is this, and that's that, and this is the way it has to be done, and you haven't even tried it. And they have no use for people of that sort. And the sort of people they have a use for are the ones who 
see that they're suffering and realize a lot of their sufferings are coming from within. And they want to learn how not to do that. In a case like that, you need to have some confidence. If you don't have the confidence that you can do it, that, that cuts the ground out from underneath your feet. This is one of the common themes that a lot of the Ajahns had to teach, is don't underestimate yourself. Saying, I don't have the merit, I don't have the perfections, I don't have what's needed for the practice. That was probably one of the main attitudes that they had in their teachings, that they would fight among the students. You see them in some of the students' recollections of what a John Munn would have to teach. You are a human being. You have everything that's needed in order to do the practice. You have to remember, in their case, a lot of these were children of peasants, came from poor families, and Thai society tends to dump on people like that. So they're used to having a very low opinion of themselves, especially in terms of this sort of activity. And a lot of Ajahn Mun and a lot of the other teachers, a lot of their instructions had to do with, you've got what it takes. Have confidence that you have what it takes and then work with that. And it's a lot easier if you have some background and a skill of some kind, reflecting on what's needed to master a skill. This is one area where our educational system is really lacking. We tend to channel kids very early on. You see someone so has a talent for art, well, you channel them into arts. Somebody else has a talent for science, you channel them into science. Somebody else seems to have mechanical abilities, you go into mechanical abilities. The kids aren't trained how to learn and how to be good at things that they're not automatically good at, which is probably one of the most necessary lessons you can learn. How to figure things out, how to look at yourself when you're doing something really poorly and not get discouraged and sit down and take it apart. What exactly is going wrong? Then from there you develop a lot of important qualities. Healthy conceit is a number, number one quality. Okay? You may not be really good at this, you've been making a lot of mistakes, but one, you're willing to learn, and two, you're able to learn. It means the ability to recognize your mistakes, the willingness to talk them over with other people, and the willingness to try something new something you didn't do before. There's a book I think it was Richard Sennett wrote it called the, the Craftsman. He talks about the character qualities and personality qualities that craftsmen developed. And number one is a sense of their own competence and their own responsibility and their own ability to learn. And in the really good cases, there are people who are willing to use their ingenuity. Some craftsmen simply learn to do the craft as well as somebody else has done it. And other people push the frontiers a little bit. Nowadays, of course, we tend to idolize the frontier pushers, even to the extent of not think, thinking that they don't have to learn the basic skills. Well, they do have to learn the basic skills. They have to go through all the steps that everybody else has to go through. Learn how to do things well that they're not automatically skilled at. And then they reach a certain point where they're ready to push, push the frontiers. And their frontier pushing is actually useful because they've already explored everything that's available already. And they want to move on. So as we're meditating, remember there are certain skills we've got to develop. It starts with really basic stuff, how you stay with the breath. When the mind slips off, how you bring it right back. 
a lot of people would like to skip over this here, this part and go straight to all the wonderful things that you read about. But you're not going to get to those wonderful things unless you've figured out the process of distraction. So when you encounter distraction, you do want to get totally discouraged. Some people say, I can't meditate, that my mind is full of distractions. Well, it's like saying, I can't go to the hospital, I'm sick. If you're really sick, you've got to go to the hospital. To recognize that this is a necessary skill. And even if it doesn't come naturally, you're going to do what you can. And so instead of getting discouraged by the distractions, try to figure it out exactly what happens when the mind is distracted. Where does it go? You might think that a lapse in mindfulness would be something impossible to see, because of course there's no mindfulness in that moment. But remember, you've got different committee members, and some of them are watching you. So take advantage of that fact. There's somebody observing the meditator here, and you want to train that observer. To anticipate, yes, there's going to be a distraction, and you want to look for the warning signs before the mind leaves the breath. How does it start surveying around to see where else it might want to go? When it starts getting bored with the breath, when it starts getting impatient, what are the warning signs? And once you see the warning signs, what can you do to make sure you stay with the breath? Make the breath deeper, make the breath more interesting, make the breath larger, whatever, gets you back on board. When you have slipped off, how can you come back as quickly as possible? One important rule of thumb is that no matter how fascinating the thought is that you've gotten distracted into, do not feel that you have to tie up the loose ends before you leave it. Leave it unfinished. Because these things never really finish. It's like those movies that seem to end and yet they always have a few seeds for the sequel. Our thoughts are like that. You see the evil person fall over the cliff. You think he's dead at the end of one sequence. Well, you know that. People who disappear off the cliff can always magically reappear. And it's the same with our, our finished thoughts. You've taken care of that issue, then you're going to come back to the breath. No, you don't have to take care of anything. Drop it immediately. Come right back. And notice the mind's resistance to that. And learn how not to listen to it. And when you do this, you learn an awful lot about the process of becoming, how you create worlds in the mind, how you take on identities in those worlds, how you start getting committed to those worlds, even though you don't really have, they're not committed to you, that's for sure. And then skill in untangling yourself from them. I mean, that's high level Dharma. And where you're going to find it? Looking at this messy business of distraction. If you're too proud to look at your distractions and figure them out, you just want to jump over them to the next wonderful stage in the concentration, you're going to miss the really important lessons. As John Lee said, one of the big problems with meditators, especially who've read a lot of Dharma, is they mistake high-level Dharma for low-level and low-level for high-level. And the lessons to be learned from this simple process of untangling yourself from distraction and learning how to anticipate and head off distractions, those are key for overcoming your clingings and cravings and becomings and birth. So be willing to learn lessons from the little things going on in the meditation that you would rather just jump over. That sense of conceit that's willing to learn from anything. 
This is where it shows its stuff, where it's really useful. See so if you can have a sense of pride, have it around this. That you're not too proud to learn from the little things. That's the pride of a craftsperson, the pride of a meditator, the desire that leads to the end of desire, the conceit that leads to the end of conceit. So look at the critical voices in your mind, the observers and the commentators, and teach them a proper set of values this way so that they actually become useful parts of the meditation. This is what directed thought and evaluation, especially the evaluation, are all about, getting the mind to settle down. So train these voices well. 